church growth experts tell us today that marketing the church is the key to growing the church. The model church is a business, and people are our customers. Sell your church to Christian customers, and you will grow. So local churches end up selling timeshare memberships to busy consumers who buy into the church that best meets their current needs. And then, when life changes, the Christian consumer simply trades his timeshare membership for a new timeshare membership in another church. This is not, not how God designed the church to function in the New Testament. We are not selling a service to customers or marketing ourselves to consumers. Biblical principles undergird church life. God lays out a blueprint for how the church is to operate. He tells us how it is to operate. The church is based upon a covenant relationship that people make with one another, much like marriage is a covenant relationship. Our job is not to market the church to Christian consumers. Our job is to follow God's blueprint in the Bible. So, as we come to the end of our study of the book of Hebrews, it's been a while we've been in this great book. There are So many great principles in this book. But as we come to the end of our study of the book of Hebrews, we come to a blueprint, if you will, for how the church is to function. And I want us to look at five principles for church life in Hebrews chapter 13. We're beginning in verse 17 and going down to the end of this book, verse 25. We will work our way through this passage. There are five principles that I want us to learn from this passage to guide us at Galilee Baptist Church as we seek to follow God's blueprint for our church ministry. Principle number one, then, we willingly follow spiritual leaders. Look at verse 17. As he closes the book, he says, Obey your leaders and submit to them, for they keep watch over your souls as those who will give an account. Let them do this with joy and not with grief, for this would be unprofitable for you. Now, a verse like this is not popular today. It does not appeal to Christian consumers at all. This is not good marketing. (laughs) It's not a good way to get people into your church to tell them to obey the leaders or submit to them. And many who leave a church do so because they don't like the decisions that are made by the leaders of the church. But I want to tell you this is a fundamental principle in the New Testament in God's blueprint for how a church should function. It's not just here. In a healthy local church, there are leaders and there are members who join with one another in a covenant relationship. Now, I want to stress it is not a matter of superiority. One is not superior to another. It's a matter of order. The church is to function in an orderly way, much like in a marriage. The Bible teaches that the husband is the head of the wife, not because he is superior to the wife, but because God designed the family to work that way. So too, the local church is designed to work in an orderly way. The New Testament calls the leaders of a local church by various names, elders, bishops, and the pattern is always a plurality of elders in every local church. So here in this verse, we read about leaders plural, that are leading the church, and members covenant with the leaders of a church to, and the commands are twofold, to obey 
and to submit to them. Now, the word translated leaders in the Greek text refers to men who were in positions of authority. The word for obey literally means to be so persuaded or convinced that one agrees to follow that leader. It means to obey a leader because you believe in the leader and are persuaded to follow that leader. So I want to stress this obedience is not servile. Servile. This obedience is not slavery, you see. This is a covenant relationship where a member trusts and believes in the leaders and so follows them in life. The second command is to submit to the leaders. The word means to yield to someone's authority. Leaders are in positions of authority. Now that's not a popular concept today either. Our culture does not like authority. But someone has to make the decisions. The church in the New Testament is not a democracy. And we are to yield to those who are in authority and must make those decisions. Now that's not a good way to market the church today. But that's what he says. Where does this authority come from? It doesn't come because leaders are superior to others. It comes ultimately from Christ. For elsewhere in the New Testament, we are taught what? That Christ is the head of the church. Christ is the head of Galilee Baptist Church. But he delegates authority to pastors and elders who operate under the umbrella of his authority. Imagine for a moment that you come to my house for a party. And as you drive up the street, you notice that the cars are parked up and down the street on the side of the street. But the driveway is open. So you drive into the open driveway and get ready to park. And a little eight-year-old girl comes out. And she says, Mr. Christensen has asked me to tell you that he wants the driveway kept open for the caterer to come get in, and would you please park on the street? Now, that little eight-year-old doesn't have a whole lot of authority in herself, does she? And you could easily overpower her, and you could easily just say, forget it, I'm parking here. But you don't. You back out and you park up the street because you respect me. I hope you do anyway. That is delegated authority. She has no authority in herself. She has it because she represents me. You don't obey her because of her. You obey her because of me. So too, when he says, obey and submit to the leaders in verse 17, you do so because of Christ as the head of the church. We do so because we respect him and we yield to the leaders because we yield to him. So we as members, he says in verse 17, are to obey and submit to the leaders of a local church. But there's a flip side to this in this verse as well, in this whole matter of order. And we see it elsewhere in the scriptures because other passages tell us that the elders and the pastors have responsibility. So Peter, for example, says in 1 Peter 5, be shepherds of God's flock. He's talking to the elders. Be shepherds of God's flock that is under your care, serving as overseers, not because you must, but because you are willing, as God wants you to be, not greedy for money, but eager to serve, not lording it over those entrusted to you, but being examples to the flock. So the leaders are not to dominate and domineer, They are not to lord it over anyone. They are not to exploit anyone. They are to serve the members in this covenant relationship. Now, back here in Hebrews 13, that spirit is carried out in the rest of verse 17. He says, obey your leaders and submit to them because, why? 
because they keep watch over your souls as those who will give an account. Let them do this with joy and not with grief, for this would be unprofitable for you. So we yield our wills to our leaders because they are responsible to keep watch over the souls of the members as men who will give an account to the Lord one day for how they have done that and what they have done. So the the word translated keep watch means to be alert. It was a word like, like a guard on the watchtower of a city stood up there and he was vigilant, he was alert for all of the dangers that might threaten the members of that city. So elders and leaders in a church are to be on alert. They are to look after and care for the souls of the members. They are to protect them from threats that might damage them. And God holds the leaders accountable for that responsibility to a church. Leaders have to do what is best for the church and for the members of that church. And the leaders of the church will settle an account with God. It's a commercial term. They will settle their account with God one day for the decisions that they make. God will settle accounts. So this is a covenant relationship, an agreement we make with one another. So when members obey and submit with the right attitude, then the leaders can watch over the members with joy. It's wonderful. But when when members do not, then there's no joy for the leaders. It is, he says, grief. You don't want it that way. It becomes sorrow for the leaders to watch over you. The word means literally a sighing or a groaning. He's talking about groaning pastors and sighing pastors. Hearts broken by the choices that are made. See, members who rebel, members who refuse to yield to the leaders, break the hearts of the leaders. And there's groaning every time you think of those people. This, God says, is not profitable for you either. It's not beneficial for you to have a groaning pastor every time he thinks about you. It's not good for you if every time I think of you, I sigh and groan. Okay? Because my heart is broken. That's not good for you. And it's not a healthy church. But believe me, there are many places and many people where pastors groan and sigh as they think of those people. So you see, members willingly follow spiritual leaders because God has established an orderly way for the church to function. Now, many of you know that when I became pastor here, before I became pastor here, this was our church. This was our home church goes back 20 years, I know, folks, but think back that far. This was our home church. We were a part of this church. I was teaching full-time at the Bible College, and we were coming here to church. I, I mean, I was an ordained pastor. I was had graduate degrees in theology. But here in this church, I submitted to the authority of Pastor Hopkins and the other leaders, deacons back then, in this church. I submitted voluntarily, willingly to that authority and supported and encouraged it. Why? Because that's the way God designed it to work. We have five retired pastors in our fellowship. And I am blessed because as they enter our fellowship, they support and pray for me and for the other elders. Why? Maybe they would have done it differently. Maybe things would have, they would have handled things differently. That's not the issue. They are here and they come in and support. And I'll tell you, I am blessed by that. I covet their prayers. They are a blessing and an encouragement to me in this fellowship. That's the way the church is supposed to function. And it leads to our second principle. We pray for the integrity of our leaders. 
verses 18 and 19, Hebrews 13. Pray for us, he says. By the way, this is a second command. First, there were two in the first, in verse 17. So this is the third command, actually. Pray for us, for we are sure that we have a good conscience designed to conduct ourselves honorably in all things, and I urge you all the more to do this that I may be restored to you sooner. So we have another command. The author of Hebrews says that he is certain that he and the other elders have a good conscience regarding what they have done and the decisions they have made. They have a clean conscience. They have tried very hard to conduct themselves to behave in a way that is honorable in all that they have done. They have sought to serve the church well. And he goes on to urge them to pray for him even more so that he can be restored to them soon. Now, that could refer to one of two possibilities. Possibly the shepherd of this church, this elder, was geographically apart from them, either because of business travels or illness, or as many surmise, he refers this more to the conflict, the criticism, the hurt that he is feeling, and he wants to be restored to them relationally, to be back where he once was in their lives. Either way, members in a church are exhorted to pray for their leaders, to pray for the integrity specifically of their leaders because, he says, we need to have a good conscience. We need to conduct ourselves honorably in all that we do, and that is not easy to do. God will hold us accountable for how well we will fulfill our duties as leaders and how we live our lives as Christians because we are servant leaders in this church. So pray for us, he says. And I echo that exhortation this morning here at Galilee Baptist Church. I covet your prayers. I know that there are some who do that regularly. I know there are some of you that do that regularly. And that is a blessing to me. Wonderful blessing. I deeply appreciate that. Remember, remember this. Criticism without prayer is sin. This is a command here. Please pray that God will keep me pure and honorable and holy and all our other leaders as well faithful to him, and that we will live in ways that honor him. Why? Because leaders can fail too. Leaders are under attack too. Leaders can dishonor the Lord. So pray that we and our families would live in a way that honors the Lord with our lives and with this ministry. All right, you say, okay, Dave. What happens, though, in all of this church relationship, church life stuff, what happens if leaders sin? What do we do then? What happens if the leaders of the church do not conduct themselves well and do not maintain a clean conscience in all that they do? Well, the New Testament provides ways to handle that as well. And Paul wrote in 1 Timothy 5 these words, To the church, do not entertain an accusation against an elder unless it is brought by two or three witnesses. You have to verify these things. Those who sin, literally it's those who continue in sin, are to be rebuked publicly so that the others may take warning. So here is the New Testament principle in summary. Christians follow leaders as leaders follow Christ. And Paul said the same thing in Elsewhere in the New Testament, there is a biblical balance that undergirds every healthy church. The covenant between leaders and members is a two-way covenant. So pray for those leaders to follow Christ faithfully. For as they follow Christ, then others can follow them and honor the Lord. This is a biblical, healthy, and active submission then that looks to the Lord as the head of his church for all that happens. And God then protects and uses that ministry. I like what Warren Wiersbe wrote uh, 
pastor, longtime pastor and author, he wrote these words, submission is not subjugation. Subjugation turns a person into a thing, destroys individuality, removes all liberty. Submission makes a person become more of what God wants him to be. It brings out individuality. It gives him the freedom to accomplish all that God has for his life and ministry. Subjugation is weakness. It is the refuge of those who are afraid of maturity. Submission is strength. It is the first step toward true maturity and ministry. That's true in marriage, that's true in family, that's true in church. Third principle this morning. We trust in God's power to do God's will. Verse 20. Now, the God of peace who brought up from the dead the great shepherd of the sheep through the blood of the eternal covenant, even Jesus our Lord, equip you in every good thing to do his will, working in us that which is pleasing in his sight through Jesus Christ, to whom be the glory forever and ever. Amen. All right, here's our bedrock. Here's our foundation. This is what we all are anchored into in this covenant relationship we call a local church. It is God's power that accomplishes God's will. That's it. It is God's power that accomplishes God's will. It's not our skills. It's not our abilities. It's not our resources. It's not our marketing. It's not our promotion. It's not our sales ability. It is God's power that accomplishes God's will. And we have to be anchored into that. He says, now the God of peace who did what? Who raised Jesus from the dead. That power, the power that raised Jesus from the dead, the resurrection power is what is available to equip us, he says, to do God's will and to please him. The word equip means to fix up. It means to put in order or restore to a good condition after damage has been done. That's the Greek word. It's like a broken arm that is splinted so it can heal. That's this word, this equipping word. So the power that raised Jesus Christ from the dead is the power that can help us please him, and it is the only way we can please him. I don't care who you are, it's the only way you can please him. We will do this only through his power. We can't do it ourselves, and whenever we try, we will fail. He restores us when we do fail by his resurrection power so that we can serve him again. He fixes us up to serve him again. That's God. Ephesians chapter 1 is all about Christ as the foundation of the church. You have to be anchored to Christ. Every church must be grounded in Him. He is the surpassing power that is available for all of those, all of us who trust Him. So a church, whether members, leaders, must be anchored into Christ to be healthy. Think of a suspension bridge. You know, a suspension bridge like the Golden Gate Bridge, for example, spans a great distance. Its strength comes from the fact that it is anchored into the bedrock. And every piece of that suspension bridge somehow connects back to that bedrock. And if it doesn't, it would, it would come apart in the earthquake. But it, every piece, every rail, every cable, everything goes back to the bedrock. That's the way it is in church. Every member, every activity, every ministry, every function, every activity has to go back to Christ, has to be anchored in Christ, the rock, if we're going to withstand the pressures of this world. Everything we do and everything we are must come back to Christ or it will not have value for eternity, and it won't last. That's a healthy church. Fourth principle, we highly value spiritual friendships. Verses 22 to 24. But I urge you, brethren, 
Bear with this word of exhortation, for I have written to you briefly. (laughs) By the way, did you catch that? Hebrews is brief. (laughs) It's a brief letter. (laughs) I have written to you briefly. Take notice that our brother Timothy has been released. We assume he was probably in prison. With whom, if he comes soon, I shall see you. Greet all of your leaders and all the saints, those from Italy, the, the Christians, the Italians, greet you. Do you catch his heartbeat here? I want to see you. Timothy's been released from prison. Praise God. I hope if he comes, we can come together and I can see you again. Why? Because I love you. That's the heartbeat here. These relationships where Christians greet one another. Most of the letters in the New Testament, if you go through the letters, most of them end this way. Sometimes they will name people like Timothy and others. Sometimes they go unnamed. But there is this ending piece in most of the letters that is all relational. It's all about those friendships. It's all about those relationships we have in Christ. Christianity is not a solo faith. It's a community faith. It's a relationship faith. It's a faith that is intended to be in living partnership with one another. Christian fellowship then is essential to church life. And we fail terribly when we fail to build these kinds of friendships with one another in his church. Jesus himself established this dynamic when he told us that we were to love one another Because by this love, the world will know that you are mine. That's our obligation in Christ. In a New York Times Magazine article, Hal Nidzviecki, I guess that's how you say his name, reflected on the social media sites that are everywhere today, and specifically Facebook. Many many of you, I'm sure, have Facebook accounts. Soon after starting his Facebook account, Hal had accumulated about 700 friends. In his own words, he was, quote, absurdly proud of how many cyber pals, connections, acquaintances, and even strangers I'd managed to sign up, unquote, as my friends. 700. But he was a workaholic, and he felt lonely, and so he thought he came up with a plan. He invited all 700 of his Facebook friends to a party at a specific location there in the area where they could meet and get to know each other. And he asked them to respond. 15 said they would come, and 60 said they might make it. When the time came, he got ready. He went to the establishment where they were supposed to meet. He waited, and he waited. And he waited, and finally one person showed up, and she wasn't even on his friend list. She was a friend of a friend, (laughs) and had seen it from that friend. They talked a little bit, and she left. He concluded his article in the New York Times with these words, 700 friends, and I was alone. Unfortunately, Many Christians are like Facebook friends. We think they're our friends, or we think we're friends of someone else. We think we have a deep relationship, but we eventually find out that they're just Facebook friends, not real ones. And what happens? It hurts. It hurts. When people leave our fellowship, it hurts. It breaks our hearts. Why? We feel rejected. We feel bad. People we thought were friends left us. That that hurts. It's hard. Why? Well, we feel hurt because we value spiritual friendships. And so 
it hurts when they leave. Let me encourage you. He gives an exhortation here and then talks about all of his relationships, his friendships. Let me exhort you or encourage you. Don't pull back into the shell when that happens. In fact, we need to work even harder. We need to work even harder at reaching out and building those kinds of friendships with others. We must not pull back. But we need to build spiritual friendships because we value spiritual friendships in the church. Fifth principle, we live by God's grace in all that we do. Verse 25, last verse of this lengthy letter. And he says, grace be with you all. That's it. Grace be with you all. Grace. What a great word to end the book of Hebrews. There is no other foundation for a church than grace. We are members of the church by grace. None of us are better than anyone else before God. We all stand before God at the foot of the cross. There's no other place. We come to God by God's grace. We don't deserve it. We didn't earn it. We accept it. That's grace. He paid for us. Grace be with you all. Isn't that great? Grace is what gets us into the church, and grace is how we are to live with one another in the church. We live by God's grace in all that we do and all that we are. Grace be with you all. Theologian Karl Barth wrote these words, Grace must find expression in life, otherwise it's not grace. Once grace is received, grace must be lived. We are to treat one another with grace. Grace be with you all. The story is told of a certain nine-year-old boy. And he was sitting in class one day when he looked down and he saw a puddle on the floor and his pants were all wet. And he shot a prayer to God, God, help me. When the boys see this, I'm dead meat. And when the girls see this, they'll never have anything to do with me again. He looks up and the teacher is starting to walk his way. And about that time, one of his classmates, a girl named Susie, is carrying a goldfish bowl full of water, walking by. And she trips and dumps the entire goldfish bowl in his lap. All of a sudden, everything changes. He pretends to be angry, but he is thankful. (laughs) And the class springs into action, and the teacher comes, and she takes him down to the office, and they clean up his clothes. And when they're all dry and he gets back to class, all of his classmates are busy under the desk. They're scrubbing everything down and getting everything in order for him. And the sympathy, oh my goodness, he is just overwhelmed with sympathy. And he feels so great. But there's a flip side. Because Susie, hmm, Susie is now the object of the entire class's ridicule. She tries to help. They said, get out of here, you klutz. Haven't you done enough mess already? As the day goes on, The sympathy for him increases. Everybody loves him. And the ridicule for Susie increases as people put her down. At the end of the day, they're headed out to the bus to get on the bus. They're waiting at the bus stop, the bus line there. And he sneaks over to Susie and he whispers to her in her ear, 
Susie, you did that on purpose, didn't you? Susie whispers back, I wet my pants once too. That's grace. That's the epitome of grace. We are all here in Galilee Baptist Church because we messed up. Every single one of us, we wet our pants somewhere. Spiritually speaking now. (laughs) No one is here who has not messed up in life. Why? Because that's the only criteria for getting into church. (laughs) You have to have messed up and accepted God's grace to cover that mess. So we know what it's like to mess up in our lives. And we know what it's like to receive grace. And since we have received grace, we give grace to others in the fellowship. We have no right to look down our spiritual noses at anyone else in this room this morning. We are all here by grace. So I say to you this morning, grace be with you all. Grace be with you all. In her book, Traveling Mercies, Anne Lamott shares a story she once heard from her minister that illustrates well the importance of church. A little seven-year-old girl had uh, gotten lost one day. The little girl ran up and down the street. She was terrified. She couldn't find her way. She was scared. She didn't know where she lived. She couldn't notice any single landmark anywhere. Finally, a policeman stopped to help her He put her in the passenger seat of his police car and they drove around the city until she finally saw her church. And she pointed it out to the policeman. She said, that's my church. And then she told him very firmly, you can let me out now. This is my church and I can always find my way home from here. And Lamont writes in her book, That is why I have stayed so close to my church. Because no matter how bad I am feeling, how lost or lonely or frightened, when I see the faces of the people at my church and hear their voices, I can always find my way home. I can always find my way home. Father, knit us together in you. There isn't one of us here better than another. We all come by your grace, and we celebrate that grace this morning in the Lord's Supper. Help us to share that grace with one another and to covenant with one another to build friendships, to work harder at that, to care for one another better. In your name and for your glory. Amen.